Welcome to The Hidden Truth. We're still pretty new to YouTube and we're looking to expand our channel. If you enjoy our videos, please consider sharing them on social media or other UFO communities. Your support means everything to us. Here are some really compelling Australian UFO cases from 1920 to 1988. Sorry about the robot voice. For now we are going to do a combination of some human narrator videos and some robot voiced ones. Our long-term goal is to have 100% of our videos with a human narrator. We are looking for volunteers. Send us an email if you are interested. 1. 1920. S.S. Amelia disappeared in the Bay Strait. Official Australian investigation into unidentified flying objects goes back as far as 1920. According to researcher Paul Norman, when the ship USS Amelia disappeared, at a time when strange unexplained lights were being reported around the entrance to the base strait, a search aircraft sent to investigate the lights also disappeared and never returned. The Bay Strait area has featured in a number of mysterious cases, most notably the disappearance of the young pilot Frederick Valentich in 1978. 2. 1942. RAF pilot with UFO near Tasman. During the summer of 1942, when an RAF pilot was on flying patrol off the Tasman Peninsula late one afternoon, following reports by fishermen of strange lights on the sea at night in Bay Strait. At 5.50 p.m. an unidentified object came out of a cloud bank, which the pilot described as a singular airfoil of glistening bronze color, about 150 feet in length and 50 feet in diameter, with a dome on top that reflected sunlight. The UFO flew alongside the plane for a few minutes, then suddenly turned away at a hell of a pace. It made another turn, then dived straight into the ocean, throwing up a regular whirlpool of waves. 3. 1944. Beaufort Bomber and the UFO in the Bay Strait. The second sighting took place one night in February, 1944, when at around 2.30 a.m., a Beaufort bomber flying at 4,500 feet over the base strait was joined by an unidentified object, described as a dark shadow, with a flickering light and flame coming out of the rear. The object appeared to be only 100 to 150 feet away, and stayed with the plane for 18 to 20 minutes, during which time both radio and direction finding instruments failed. Eventually, the object shot off at about three times the speed of the bomber, 235 miles per hour at that time. Reports indicate that no enemy action was ever confirmed in the base strait, although a total of 17 aircraft went missing in that area during World War II. 4. 1954. Navy Hawker Sea Fury and the UFOs. On August 31, 1954, a Navy Hawker Sea Fury aircraft was approached by two strange lights with vague shapes underneath, 5,000 meters above Galbum, New South Wales. The pilot radioed Nora Naval Air Station and was informed that the objects were tracked on radar. The lights shot past the Sea Fury spinning at fantastic speed. So sensitive was the security ban on the incident that not even the Minister for Navy was advised about it at the time. Although UFO files were initially classified secret, this sighting was rated top secret and details would never have been known for many years had the story not been leaked to the media five months after the incident. That same year, the Minister for Air, William McMahon, contracted the RAF formally to investigate UFO reports. 5. 1957. The Marlinga case in South Australia, an extraordinary eyewitness account of a UFO, seen hovering over the former British nuclear test site at Marlinga, South Australia, 
was given to the British researcher Jenny Randalls by a Royal Air Force Corporal stationed there at the time. Following nuclear detonations, in September and October of 1957, an unidentified object was seen hovering over the airfield by the corporal and some colleagues. Described as a magnificent sight, the craft was of a silver-blue color with a metallic luster. The corporal said that the object had a line of windows or portholes along its edge, and that it was seen so distinctly that metallic plating could be made down on its surface. A near traffic control officer is also alleged to have seen the object, and checks with Alice Springs and Edinburgh airfields revealed that there were no aircraft in the vicinity at the time. No photographs were taken, the RAF corporal said, because the top security status of the base area meant that all cameras had to be locked away. The UFO departed swiftly and silently after about 15 minutes. I swear to you as a practicing Christian, this was no dream, no illusion, no fairy story, but a solid craft of metallic construction. The witness stole Jenny Randall's. 6. 1960. USAF pilot UFO sighting near Asmania. On November 15, 1960, about 50 kilometers from Cressy, Tasmania, a U.S. Air Force Sar B-57 aircraft operating out of RAFE sail encountered a UFO. And the following is the pilot's official report. Approximately 1040 hours while flying on a mission track 15 miles north of Launceston, my navigator called out an aircraft approaching to our left and slightly lower. Our altitude at this time was 40,000 feet, TS of 350 knots, heading of 340 degrees. I spotted the object and immediately commented to the navigator that it was not an aircraft, but looked more like a balloon. We judged its altitude to be approximately 35,000 feet, heading 140 degrees, and its speed extremely high. From a previous experience, I would say its closing rate would have been in excess of 800 knots. We observed this object for five or seven seconds before it disappeared under the left wing. Since it was unusual in appearance, I immediately banked to the left for another look, but neither of us could locate it. The color of the object was nearly translucent, somewhat like that of a poached egg. There were no sharp edges, but rather fuzzy and undefined. The size was approximately 70 feet in diameter, and it did not appear to have any depth. 7. 1965. Ansatana sighting near Brisbane. On May 28, 1965, at about 325 hours, an Ansatana DC-6 bearliner, registration VHINH, was paced by an unidentified flying object. During a flight from Brisbane to Port Moresby, New Guinea, Captain John Barker described the object as oblate in shape with exhaust gases emanating from it, and related that it paced the airliner for 10 to 15 minutes, witnessed by the co-pilot and a stewardess. The sighting took place in the vicinity of Balgainville Reef, off the Queensland coast, and Captain Barker radioed details to Townsville Ground Control, adding that he was taking photographs of the object. On landing at Port Moresby, Barker was informed that he was not to have the film processed in New Guinea, but was to return with it to Australia. When he eventually arrived at Brisbane, Captain Barker was flown directly to Canberra, where both the film and the flight recorder were confiscated. The source of this story is William Moore, duty officer of the Department of Civil Aviation at Townsville, who was in radio contact with Captain Barker. When he relayed details of the sighting, or passed on the information to John Meskell, a detective with the Criminal Investigation Branch, who had been on duty at the Townsville Control Tower at the time. Meskel stated that Thor had been forbidden to discuss the incident, 
but added to this latter part is only hearsay and came for more. Who then told me that the chief of DC, a Department of Civil Aviation, came to Townsville and took the 12 hour tapes from the DC a control tower with the full conversation between Nor and the pilot. And Nor was told to shut his mouth about the whole thing under threat of his job. The Directorate of Air Force Intelligence in Canberra denied in a letter to Peter Norris that any such incident had taken place. This is the first information we have received of the reported sighting and therefore have no record of the incident. Perhaps you may care to follow the matter up with the Department of Civil Aviation. But as it is normal practice for that department to refer all sightings to the RAF, it seems most unlikely that they had it reported. Peter Norris accordingly wrote to the DC and received the following reply. We asked our Brisbane office to check whether air traffic control personnel at Townsville had any knowledge of the reported sightings. On the 28th of May, no persons on duty that day have any recollection of unusual communications and we have not received any formal incident report by any airline captain operating in the vicinity of Townsville that day. Unfortunately, our communications recording tapes are reused after a holding period of 90 days, and we therefore cannot use this source to confirm belief that there were no unusual communications through departmental facilities. But according to Stan Sears, the distinguished researcher Dr. J. Allen Hynek obtained a copy of Captain Barker's official statement to the Australian authorities from the U.S. Air Force via the Australian Department of Air, which states in part, I had always scoffed at these reports, but I saw it. We all saw it. It was under intelligent control, and it was certainly no known aircraft. There is no reference to this remarkable sighting in the RAF summary of unidentified Darial. Sightings reported to the Department of Air, 19601965, a revealing omission indeed. 8. 1973. UFO incident at Northwest Cape. On October 25, 1973, Two U.S. Navy personnel observed a UFO hovering near the restricted Naval Communication Station at Northwest Cape, Western Australia, which is used by the National Security Agency, in conjunction with Australia's Defense Signals Directorate, the Department of Defense. RAF report relating to the incident was acquired a few years later by Bill Chalker who was surprised that such a report was made available to a civilian researcher. At about 1915 hours that day, Lieutenant Commander M sighted a large black airborne object approximately 8 kilometers to the west at an estimated altitude of 600 meters. After about 20 to 25 seconds, the craft accelerated at unbelievable speed and disappeared to the north, he reported. There was no noise or exhaust. The second witness, Fire Captain Bill L, described the sighting as follows. At 19.20 hours, I was called by the POW to close the officer's club. I proceeded toward the club in the fire department pickup 488, when my attention was drawn to a large black object, which at first I took to be a small cloud formation due west of Area B, the location of the high-frequency transmitter. On alighting from pickup 488, I stood for several minutes and watched this black sphere hovering. The sky was clear and pale green-blue. No clouds were about whatsoever. The object was completely stationary except for a halo around the center, which appeared to be either revolving or pulsating. After I had stood watching it for approximately four minutes, it suddenly took off at tremendous speed and disappeared in an orderly direction in a few seconds. I consider this object to have been approximately 10 meters in diameter, 
hovering at 300 meters over the hills due west of the base. It was black, maybe due to my looking in the direction of the setting sun. No lights appeared on it at any time. My take. These incidents are all pretty good. I see a trend here and have come to a conclusion. I will not be flying any aircraft over or near the base straight anytime soon. Resources. Above top secret, Timothy Good, 1988. I would like to thank one of our members for putting me onto this event that I did not previously know about. Thank you, Rob Ross. The year is 1966. The place, West O High School in West All Australia. Over 300 students and teachers observed a UFO in broad daylight. The UFO overflew the high school and disappeared behind a stand of trees. The UFO was eventually chased away by some conventional aircraft. On April 6, 1966, at about 11 a.m., Andrew Greenwood was a teacher at West o High School. At this time, a hysterical child ran into his classroom and told him there's a flying saucer outside. He thought this child had become deranged or something so he didn't take any notice. But when the child insisted that this object was in the sky, he decided to go out and have a look for himself. When Greenwood went outside, he noticed a group of children looking towards the northeast area of the school grounds, and as he approached them, he saw a UFO hovering close to the power line. Greenwood described it as a round, silver object, about the size of a car with a metal rod sticking up in the air. Soon after, five planes came and surrounded the object as more people began gathering to watch the scene before them. He called it the most amazing flying he had ever seen in his life, McDonald said. The planes were doing everything possible to approach the object, and he said how they all avoided a collision. He will never know. Every time they got too close to the object, it would slowly accelerate then rapidly accelerate and then move away from them and stop. Then they would take off after it again, and the same thing would happen. This game of cat and mouse reportedly went on for about 20 minutes, and by this time Greenwood said, 350 children and staff were watching on. Suddenly the UFO shot away and vanished within seconds, and it was at this point that the headmaster came out and ordered everyone to go back to class. Over the years, there were reports that the government tried to cover up the incident and stop witnesses from talking, but Greenwood claimed it was the headmaster that first tried to squash discussion of the incident. He gave the school a lecture and told the children they would be severely punished if they talked about this matter and told the staff they could lose their jobs if they mentioned it at all, McDonald said. The teacher claimed the headmaster was so scared and disturbed by the incident that he refused to come outside until the object was gone. When the Royal Australian Air Force contacted the headmaster, he told them to go and jump in a lake. McDonald said, there have been claims from several witnesses that sharply dressed men in black suits visited them and warned them from speaking about the incident. This lines up with a few experiences Greenwood had when he tried to speak with other witnesses about what they saw. At the time of seeing the UFO, he was a complete skeptic himself. He has never even considered the possibility of their existence, McDonald said. When he asked the physical education teacher to describe what she had seen herself so that he could compare it with his own observation, she just wouldn't say anything. Greenwood then reportedly spoke to one of the older students who described the event in great detail, exactly as he had seen it. But when he spoke to her again half an hour later, she wouldn't say a word. Greenwood didn't think it had anything to do with the headmaster's threats, as no one usually took him seriously, and he knew for a fact that the student he spoke with didn't attend the meeting where he made the threats. 
McDonald's description of his interview with Greenwood offers a rare insight into the events from the eyes of someone who was an adult at the time. See below in comments. My take. This is an excellent example of a genuine UFO encounter. Daylight towers and numerous witnesses. It comes down to whether or not it's an alien craft or some secret government reproduction vehicle of some kind. Anyone who claims this was a weather balloon is either a liar or an idiot. Resources. Ally Foster, News Kamau on August 7, 2018. The year is 1968, a flight from Adelaide to Perth, Australia. A formation of UFOs was witnessed by two pilots. The UFOs made maneuvers that conventional aircraft could not make. The UFOs did not show up on radar. The sighting lasted about 10 minutes. On August 22, 1968, at about 9.40 hours, Captains Walter Garding and Gordon Smith were flying an eight-seat Piper Navajo, registration VHRTO, was returning empty from Adelaide and cruising at 8,000 feet, with an airspeed of 190 to 195 knots and tracking 270 degrees magnetic. Smith was asleep in the cabin when the sighting first occurred. At 9.40 hours, Walter abruptly waked me in great excitement and asked me to come into the cockpit quickly. I did so, and he asked me if I could see what he was looking at. At first I didn't, because I was still suffering from the effect of sleep. However, after about 30 seconds I could see what he was excited about, some distance ahead at the same level, and about 50 degrees to my right I was in the right seat. I saw a formation of aircraft. In the middle was a large aircraft, and four mat to the right and left and above were four or five smaller aircraft. We were on a track of 270 degrees and these aircraft appeared to be maintaining station with us. As we had not been notified of this traffic, I radioed Calgary Department of Civil Aviation Communications Center asking them what traffic they or RAF had in our area. The answer was none. So I then notified Calgary that we had this formation in sight and they, in turn, notified some eastbound traffic of the danger of unidentified traffic 130 in and east of Calgary. At about this time, we lost communications with Calgary on all frequencies. We were receiving Calgary carrier wave with no voice propagation, only a hash and static. In the next 10 minutes, I transmitted about seven times, and I believe Walter did about five times with no results. Also at about this time, we noticed that the main ship split into two sections still maintaining the same level and the smaller aircraft then flew out left and right but staying in the same level and coming back to the two main halves of the bigger ship. At this time there appeared to be about six smaller aircraft taking turns of going out and coming back and formatting on the two halves. Sometimes the two halves joined and split, and the whole cycle continued for ten minutes. The shape of the main ship seemed to have the ability to change, not drastically, but from, say, spheroid to a slightly elongated form with the color maintaining a constant dark gray to black. However, the smaller craft had a constant cigar shape and were of a very dark color. Their travel out and back had a peculiarity not associated with normal aircraft in that they appeared to travel out and come back without actually turning like a normal airplane would have to do. At 9.50 hours, the whole formation joined together as if at a single command, then departed at a tremendous speed. It did not disappear as, say, gas would, but it departed in about three or four seconds diminishing in size till out of sight. Captain Smith reported that radio communications were restored immediately following the departure of the UFOs. Distance of the objects was impossible to estimate since their size was unknown, 
but for comparative size the main craft compared with a Boeing 707 as seen from 10 miles away. Neither Guarding nor Smith had the presence of mind to check if any deviation existed in our magnetic compass or automatic direction finder whilst in the presence of the UFOs, they said. Explanations in terms of balloons, conventional aircraft, tricks of light, gases, etc., were ruled out by the pilots. We conclude that the UFOs were in fact aircraft with the solidity of aircraft, except perhaps for the fact of the ability of the larger UFO to split and change shapes lightly. When the distinguished American atmospheric physicist and UFO researcher Dr. James McDonald attempted to make further inquiries about the incident, the pilots refused to respond. Years later, a pilot member of the Victorian UFO Research Society who was personally acquainted with guarding and Smith confirmed that the captains had been ordered not to discuss the encounter further. My take. This was an extraordinary encounter. Daylight hours. Clear skies. Two pilots observing the same thing. Communications going down while in proximity to the UFOs. The craft making maneuvers impossible even today. This appears to me the real deal here, folks. Resources. Summary from above top secret. Timothy Good, 1988. The year is 1978. The place, over the base straight near Cape Otway, Australia. Frederick Valentick a 20-year-old flying instructor who disappears in his Cessna 182 aircraft shortly after reporting a UFO sighting. On October 21, 1978, at around 1900 hours, 20-year-old Frederick Valentik was flying his Cessna 182 aircraft over the base straight near Cape Otway, Australia. At this time, he contacted the Melbourne Radio Tower. 19 hours 6 minutes and 14 seconds Cessna. Melbourne this is Delta Sierra Juliet, is there any known traffic below 5000? 19 hours 6 minutes and 23 seconds Tower. Delta Sierra Juliet no known traffic. 19 hours 6 minutes and 26 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet IM seems to be a large aircraft below 5000. 19 hours 6 minutes and 46 seconds tower. DD Delta Sierra Juliet, what type of aircraft is it? 19 hours 6 minutes and 50 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet, I cannot affirm it is four bright, it seems to me like landing lights. 19 hours 7 minutes and 4 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet. 19 hours 7 minutes and 32 seconds Cessna. Melbourne this is Delta Sierra Juliet the aircraft has just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. 19 hours 7 minutes and 43 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet Roger and it is a large aircraft confirmed. 19 hours 7 minutes and 47 seconds Cessna er unknown due to the speed it's traveling is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity 19 hours 7 minutes and 57 seconds tower Delta Sierra Juliet no known aircraft in the vicinity 19 hours 8 minutes and 18 seconds Cessna Melbourne it's approaching now from due east towards me 19 hours 8 minutes and 28 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet. 19 hours 8 minutes and 42 seconds. Open microphone for 2 seconds. 19 hours 10 minutes and 49 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game he's flying over me 2 to 3 times at a time at speeds I could not identify. 19 hours 9 minutes and 2 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet Roger what is your actual level? 19 hours 9 minutes and 6 seconds Cessna. My level is 4 and a half thousand 4500. 19 hours 9 minutes and 11 seconds tower. 
Delta Sierra Juliet and confirm that you cannot identify the aircraft. 19 hours 9 minutes and 14 seconds Cessna. Affirmative. 19 hours 9 minutes and 18 seconds Tower. Delta Sierra Juliet Roger standby. 19 hours 9 minutes and 28 seconds Cessna. Melbourne Delta Sierra Juliet it's not an aircraft it is. Open microphone for 2 seconds. 19 hours 9 minutes and 46 seconds Tower. Delta Sierra Juliet can you describe the your aircraft? 19 hours 9 minutes and 52 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet as it's flying past it's a long shape. Open microphone for 3 seconds. Cannot identify more than that it has such speed. Open microphone for 3 seconds. Before me right now Melbourne. 19 hours 10 minutes and 7 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet Roger and how large would the ER object be? 19 hours 10 minutes and 20 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet Melbourne it seems like it's stationary what I'm doing right now is orbiting and the thing is just orbiting on top of me also it's got a green light and sort of metallic like it's all shiny on the outside. 19 hours 10 minutes and 43 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet. 19 hours 10 minutes and 48 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet. Open microphone for 5 seconds. It's just vanished. 19 hours 10 minutes and 57 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet. 19 hours 11 minutes and 3 seconds Cessna. Melbourne would you know what kind of aircraft I've got is it a type military aircraft. 19 hours 11 minutes and 8 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet confirmed the Ur aircraft just vanished. 19 hours 11 minutes and 14 seconds Cessna. Say again. 19 hours 11 minutes and 17 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet is the aircraft still with you. 19 hours 11 minutes and 23 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet it's on all. Open microphone for 2 seconds. Now approaching from the southwest. 19 hours 11 minutes and 37 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet. 19 hours 11 minutes and 52 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet the engine is rough idling. IV got it set at 2324 and the thing is coughing. 19 hours 12 minutes and 4 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet Roger, what are your intentions? 19 hours 12 minutes and 9 seconds Cessna. My intentions are I to go to King Island on Melbourne that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. 2 seconds open microphone. It is hovering and it's not an aircraft. 19 hours 12 minutes and 22 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet. 19 hours 12 minutes and 28 seconds Cessna. Delta Sierra Juliet Melbourne. 17 seconds open microphone. 19 hours 12 minutes and 49 seconds tower. Delta Sierra Juliet Melbourne. There is no record of any further transmissions from the aircraft. The weather in the Cape Otway area was clear with a trace of stratocumulus cloud at 5,000 to 7,000 feet, scattered cirrus cloud at 30,000 feet, excellent visibility and light winds. The end of daylight at Cape Otway was at 1918 hours. The alert phase of SAR search and rescue procedures was declared at 1912 hours and at 1933 hours when the aircraft did not arrive at King Island, the distress phase was declared and search action commenced. An intensive air, sea and land search was continued until the 25th of October 1978, but no trace of the aircraft was found. The search and rescue operation was headed by an RAF Orion Maritime Reconnaissance Aircraft assisted by some light aircraft. Although an oil slick, 
was found about 18 miles north of King Island on the 22nd of October, it was not established as having any connection with Valand Explain. The Cessna was equipped with a radio survival beacon, but nothing was heard from it. Paul Norman learned that aircraft pilots were requested to report sightings of UFOs and lights in the sky, and those who were flying at the same time and using the same radio frequency were instructed not to divulge any details of their communications. Attempts were made to make it look as though Valent Explain was not in the location he reported. Steve Roby the Melbourne Flight Service Unit Controller was absolutely convinced that Valentik was not perpetrating a hoax. Towards the end, I think he was definitely concerned for his safety. He said, I considered that he would have had to have been a good actor to have put it all together the way he did. It was a kind of rushed communication, as if he was startled. Frederick Valentik's father, Guido, told me that he was given a copy of the recorded communications of his son by the Department of Transport, with Roby's voice deleted. But Bill Chalker has heard part of the complete tape which is in the possession of Dr. Richard Haynes, an ASA research scientist. Haynes' preliminary findings concluded that a strange 17-second burst of metallic noise which followed Valendic S last transmission contained 36 separate bursts with fairly constant start and stop pulses bounding each one. There are no discernible patterns in time or frequency. The effect, Dr. Haynes said, was similar to rapid keying of the microphone but control tests were noticeably different from the original sound. As to the original tape, Bill Chalker told me that the Department of Aviation erased it, or so he was informed by the Assistant Secretary of Air Safety Investigation, Woodward, who also claimed that no further cop is existed. The official verdict. In May 1982, the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation, Australian Department of Aviation, released its official findings to parties having a bona fide interest in the occurrence. The Aircraft Accident Investigation Summary Report concludes, Location of occurrence, not known, time, not known, degree of injury, presumed fatal, opinion as to cause. The reason for the disappearance of the aircraft has not been determined. Bill Chalker was highly dissatisfied with this conclusion and tried to extract further information from G.V. Hughes, then Assistant Secretary of Air Safety Investigation. Chalker asked if there had been any further official investigation of a possible UFO connection with the disappearance. Hughes replied, the RAF is responsible for the investigation of reports concerning UFO sightings, and liaison was established with the RAF on these aspects of the investigation. The decision as to whether or not the UFO report is to be investigated rests with the RAF and not this department. What happened to Valentin? Many theories have been advanced to account for the mysterious disappearance of Delta Sierra Juliet and its young pilot. Some feasible, others bizarre. Had Valenic staged the whole incident? For example, there is no evidence at all for this, other than an unsubstantiated rumor that he was seen alive and well and working at a gas service station in Tasmania. Unofficially, the chief coordinator of the search and rescue team, Mr. Eddie, told Guido Valendic that he thought the Cessna had simply ditched in the water and disappeared within a minute, taking the pilot with it. But as Guido pointed out, the Cessna 182 is constructed of modular units which should float on impact. Secondly, VHF radio would not be able to transmit below 1,000 feet from the aircraft test position of 90 miles from Melbourne, and Valendix communications with the flight service unit were loud and clear to the last word, as was the 17-second burst of metallic noise which followed. This confirms that he was still above 1,000 feet, 
and Guido is convinced that his son was still at 4,500 feet when contact was lost. We may never know exactly what happened to Frederick Valentik, but the evidence strongly suggests that he encountered an unidentified Dario object which was in some way responsible for his disappearance. If so, the Australian government would have a good reason for playing down the incident and the UFO subject in general. My take. This is a very famous and well-discussed case. I only included as I wanted to be thorough. This event is obviously a case where Valendik was either abducted by the occupants of the UFO or that the UFO caused his plane to crash. It is highly unlikely that this is a hoax that has continued for over 40 years. Some of the official explanations were laughable at best. Venus and that he was flying upside down. Resources. Summary from above top secret, Timothy Good, 1988. I would like to thank one of our members for putting me onto this event that I did not previously know about. Thank you, David Haber. The year is 1978, the place between Blenheim and Christchurch, New Zealand. Several pilots on several different flights and a news crew witnessed multiple UFOs in the skies. The UFOs were following them and it is mostly caught on film. On December 21, 1978, Safe Fair pilots Vern Powell and Ian Peary spotted strange lights while flying from Blenheim to Christchurch. A producer for Melbourne's Channel Zero, now Channel 10, Leonard Lee heard the news and tracked down reporter Quentin Fogarty, who worked for the channel but was on holiday with his wife and children in Christchurch, staying at TV1 journalist Dennis Grant's home. Friel and Swellington cameraman David Crockett was also hired, along with his wife Gare, who operated the audio tape recorder. The group were invited to jump aboard Safe Fair's Blenheim-based Stargacy plane, named Merchant Enterprise, late on December 30, 1978, which pilots Bill Startup and Bob Gard were taking on a newspaper run between Wellington and Christchurch. Shortly after takeoff, the pilots noticed strange lights appearing and disappearing over the Kaikoura coast lying about 20 miles west. While we were filming a stand-up to camera, Captain Bill Startup shouted to us that we should go to the flight deck immediately as something was happening again, says David Crockett. He managed to film a rapidly moving, bright white light with the conversation coming through my headphones from the pilots and radar from Wellington. It all started to get very scary, says Nger Crockett. I was able to stand up a couple of times and was able to see these bright light coming and going. Quentin was a real mess and grabbed hold of both my hands and started shaking. I didn't have time to worry about myself. I had to help him. One object reportedly followed the aircraft almost until landing. The plane landed at Christchurch to unload newspapers and the pilots asked the news team if they wanted to go back through the area they had traversed. Gare was too frightened so stayed in Christchurch. The others reboarded the plane with Dennis Grant in Gare's place. David had used up all the film in his 16mm camera, Grant says. Quentin called me sometime after midnight from Christchurch Airport to see if I could provide a fresh roll of film. I could, but there was a catch. I wanted to get on the plane for the flight to Blenheim. The plane took off at 2.16 a.m. About three minutes after takeoff, the group saw a bright, round light to the right. The airplane radar showed a target in the same direction about 18 nautical miles. When the aircraft reached about 2,000 feet, it encountered what appeared to be a large lighted orb which fell into station off the wing tip and tracked along with the cargo aircraft for almost quarter of an hour, while being filmed, watched, tracked on the aircraft radar, and described on a tape recording made by the TV film crew. 
The UFO was very large and had five white flashing lights that were visible on the craft. Some people say that they could see some little discs drop from the UFO and then disappear. The pilots described some of the lights to be the size of a house and others small but flashing brilliantly. Fogarty would later be heard saying on camera, Let's hope they're friendly. Crockett filmed the light for several minutes as it appeared to travel along with the plane. When they turned toward it, the light seemed to react by moving away from the airplane. The experience itself was extraordinary, Fogarty says. Just being on the cramp, noisy flight deck of the Argosy barreling down the coast in the dead of the night was exciting. Factor in a row of pulsating, hypnotic lights hovering outside the window, and it goes to another level. After landing at Woodburn Airport at about 3 a.m., the group stayed at the two pilots' homes in Blenheim. Startup's daughter Tracy Moore remembers her father coming home in the middle of the night. Everyone was at our house talking about it in the middle of the night. They were talking about lights, unexplained radar. At one point, I remember Dad saying it might be a good idea to report it to the police. It was during the Cold War. There was a bit of paranoia around. Mom said you can't sit on this information. It was scary at the time. It was a big unknown thing that had happened and we had all the adults around discussing it. There were certainly no jokes being made. Fogarty interviewed the pilots before flying to Melbourne to give the recordings to Channel Zero. The footage featured on primetime news that night and a longer documentary piece screened later. The news went around the world and was featured by major news media including by The Herald and by CBS anchorman Walter Cronkite. The skeptical reaction was immediate. Explanations included that it was Venus, drug runners, light reflected from cabbages or squid boats. The Robert Muldoon government ordered an inquiry by the Air Force, which concluded that the sightings could be explained by natural but unusual phenomena. Leonard Lee traveled to the United States to give the film to Bruce Maccabee, an optical physicist who specialized in laser technology and worked for the United States Navy in Maryland, Virginia. He was also flown to New Zealand and Melbourne to interview witnesses. A spate of sightings followed the initial report and an Air Force Skyhook was put on standby to investigate any positive sightings. They have appeared intermittently since the initial December 1978 sightings, with the most recent sighting being reported during 2015. Declassified documents from the CIA, taken after the dispatch of a Lockheed P-3 Orion to the area after the sightings, stated that the sightings were unique among civilian UFO reports because there is a large amount of documentary evidence which includes the recollections of seven witnesses, two tape recordings made during the sightings, the detection of some unusual ground and airplane radar targets, and a 16 mm color movie. In December 2010, the New Zealand military released a classified report on the incident under the Freedom of Information Act, which concludes the same thing. My take. This is a really great incident. Multiple witnesses, including a news crew and 16 mm film. The official explanations are laughable at best. More people need to wake up to the UFO reality. Resources. Wikiwan.com. The year is 1988, the place, near the Nullarbor Plain, Australia. The Knowles family had a terrifying encounter with a UFO that attacked their car and tried to carry them away. There was also missing time involved and an official police investigation. On January 20, 1988, at about 2.30 hours, Patrick Knowles, his mother and two brothers, were driving from Perth to Melbourne. At this time, Patrick advised, we were going to drive straight through in shifts 
and we planned to cross the desert at night when the heat wasn't so bad. By 2.30 a.m. we were in the Nullarbor Plain. We stopped for petrol and switched drivers. Sean was driving, and I was in the front seat next to him. The road was empty. Suddenly we saw a bright yellow light up ahead and Sean slowed down. As we got closer, the yellow light seemed to be emanating from an egg-shaped object hovering just above ground level. We thought we might be seeing things, but then a car of Ann passed going the other way, and it swerved sharply to avoid the luminous egg. The closer we got to it, the more we realized it wasn't a normal vehicle or a road signal or anything like that. Sean swerved to avoid it and we continued on, leaving it behind. The object started towards us. It appeared to accelerate with tremendous speed. We drove on and it literally chased us. The faster we went to get away from it, the faster this object went after us. I recon we reached a speed of 125 miles per hour, but it caught up in a matter of seconds. Then Sean made a sudden U-turn and headed back west in the direction of the petrol station. The UFO also turned around. I don't know how the hell it was flying because it didn't have any wings or anything like wings. It just kept coming after us. Sean made another fast U-turn heading back toward Melbourne again, but the UFO turned as well and kept pace with the car. In the back seat, everyone was scared. The dog started barking and whining. Then we were hit. It shot a beam of light out and punctured our back tire. The back tire was on fire. We started sliding across the road. I realized if we braked, we would have to confront the UFO but Sean didn't have any choice. Then it landed on the roof of the car and picked the car up. It lit up the car like a microwave. The heat was intense. Our hair was standing straight up and we felt really funny, like we were being dehydrated. It was awful, frightening, like our brains were being sucked out. My fear was that I would be pulled out of my body. I put my hand out of the window and touched something spongy that burned my hand. I thought we were going to die. You could actually feel the car rising in the air. The car began to fill with a thick black fog. It was so hot, and all this soot, this junk, started covering us. Our voices started changing. You know how a tape deck sounds when the batteries start to go flat. That's what it was like. Then I passed out. I came to when I heard a tremendous noise, like a bang, and our car suddenly dropped back to earth. Dawn was coming up. The thing just flew away. That was the last we saw of it. I had to change the tire, and we tried to clean out the black soot. There were marks on the roof of the car. As soon as we could, we drove fast to the nearest roadhouse. We were too shocked to talk for a while. Then we realized we had lost a couple of hours' time during the incident. We called the police. The funny thing was they were already looking for us. Someone, maybe the people in the caravan we passed, had phoned the police anonymously. Their report states that they witnessed our car being picked up off the road and shaken violently. They noticed the car was covered in black hash. The police inspected our car and noted the ash, the bad smell, and the dents on the roof. They were convinced something had occurred. They took us to the hospital where we were treated for burns and shock. But then the media got hold of the incident. I don't think a single reporter or journalist asked sensible questions or tried to console us for our fear. They just wanted to humiliate us. When our car was examined by forensic scientists, they found unexplained high concentrations of chlorine, an element not usually present in cars, animals, or the desert environment. My family does not need proof of this sore because we all know what we witnessed and what we went through that night. The police dismissed any suggestion of a hoax. We were a little bit skeptical at first, said Sergeant Jim Fernal of Sidana Police in the state of South Australia. 
But after investigating, we are treating the reports very seriously. He said for insect scientists would examine the black powdery ash found inside and outside Noel's car. On a side note, a crew on a tuna boat 50 miles away also said they were buzzed by an unidentified flying object minutes later and that their voices become unintelligible as a result. He said the crew of the tuna boat could not have known about the Knowles experience when they reported a UFO sighting in the Great Australia Bight, a body of water off the Australian coast. My take. This is an excellent encounter. Four witnesses, physical evidence at the scene and to the call. There was burn marks on the victims. Even the police said this was not a hoax. I couldn't find out anything about the missing time. Wonder if the family ever did hypnotic regression. What do you think? Resources. Martha Cliff for Malinland, April 19, 2017.